Fusion, the international science radio show. We have a bouncer on the doors of perception. Yeah, 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 yeah. The good, the bad, the ugly. It gets pretty exciting. The myths, the truths. <sighs> Toxicology, astro seismology, magnetism, the dark side, genetically engineered potatoes, planetoid, planetoid. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Diffusion. Sit back and relax while we inject weird and wonderful science directly into your genes. I'm Ian Wolf. On this edition, Kelly Clemens talks about addiction and epigenetics. And Sarah Perkins Kirkpatrick talks about heat waves. The news will return next week. Addictive drugs can act on the way genes are expressed in your brain. Dr. Kelly Clemens is a senior research associate in the School of Psychology at the University of New South Wales. She researches drugs of abuse and how they interact with the brain. I visited her office and began by asking her, what are epigenetics? So epigenetics traditionally has been thought of as heritable changes in gene expression that occur across generations, but we now know that that's not the case. So the modern definition of epigenetics is changes in gene expression that are not due to changes in DNA itself. So it's not like a mutation, it's that your genes are staying the same, but they're essentially being switched on or off, much like a light switch being switched on or off. So that the genes that are important for a cell and whichever organ in your body are switched on so they can function normally, but genes that are not necessarily important are switched off. So for example, in your eye you need your retinal cells to express certain proteins so that you can detect light, but those cells or cells in your liver don't necessarily need those same proteins, they need liver enzymes. So it's a way of making sure that the cells in different parts of your body do the thing that they're supposed to, but also allows for quite a different function in the brain. So in the brain, it's connected to memory? Yeah, so in the brain, what we've realised is that epigenetics is a a means of potentially um, interacting with long-term memory formation in the brain. So for a really long time, um, we have thought that long-term memory formation requires structural changes in the connections between neurons. And that's certainly the case, but now what we've found is that those structural changes can be mediated by epigenetic mechanisms. So in this case, you're talking about molecules that change which genes are expressed and which ones aren't? Yeah, so basically um, what we're talking about is um, the ability of different genes to be switched on or off as needed by the brain um, in response to different environmental or learning stimuli that essentially lead to um, that gene being required uh, to uh, lead to a neuroplastic change in the brain. So the way that brain cells operate changes depending on which genes are expressed when? Yeah, so... For short-term memories, we don't require protein synthesis. They're very transient. It just requires some changes in neurotransmitters and connections between different neurons and signaling between different neurons. But for that memory to become a long-lasting memory, you need structural changes. And so those structural changes require new proteins, and the regulation of those proteins occurs via epigenetic mechanisms. So when we're talking about these epigenetic mechanisms, it's important to remember that the DNA code in each of your cells is the same and the DNA strand is about two metres long. So it's highly elastic and also requires organisation within your cell so that its function can be realised. And so with this super long DNA strand, it's organised by being coiled around histone proteins. And so Essentially, these histone proteins are like spools around which cotton is coiled. And so these proteins can either be quite closely attracted to each other or repelled from each other depending on their charge. And so if they're quite closely attracted to each other, the DNA is not accessible for transcription. And so the gene is essentially turned off. But if these histone proteins are repelling each other and form quite a what's called an open chromatin state, then those genes can quite easily be transcribed and can quite easily have their downstream effects in terms of memory formation or many, many other functions. So whether there's DNA is tightly coiled or loosely coiled can lead to differences in whether that gene can be expressed or not. So your DNA is electric? Well, everything has charge and 
the more the histone proteins that the charge differs. So one of the main ways that particularly for my sort of work is that we look at histone acetylation. So the histone can be modified via the addition of acetyl groups via different enzymes. And if it is highly acetylated, then it has open chromatin and a lot of gene transcription. And this process of acetylation is catalyzed by some enzymes. And we know that drugs of abuse, including nicotine, can interact with these enzymes. So nicotine cravings can be triggered by memories and environments. Yeah, so nicotine is a really interesting drug that I think probably doesn't receive as much attention as it needs to anymore because a lot of people tend to think that it's a problem that's been solved. And certainly the rates of smoking in Australia have decreased a lot, but uh, it still represents a really enormous health issue for Australia. A lot of people still smoke and have a lot of trouble giving up. And one of the main reasons is because nicotine itself is not terribly rewarding. It doesn't produce a high like something like cocaine does, but it has the ability to facilitate the encoding of the environments, the context, the people in which you're smoking so that those cues can actually become very powerful in eliciting cravings in the absence of the cigarette. So, for example, if you're trying to quit, you might stop smoking at work and um, in a certain situation, but as soon as you go out to the pub, then that's a trigger and you start smoking again. Not necessarily because you really want the high, but because the, it just elicits this craving. So it's a memory enhancer. Yeah, so nicotine is widely known to be a cognitive enhancer. And in fact, there is some suggestion that it could have utility in the treating the early stages of Alzheimer's disease, where cognitive impairment is a feature. And those sorts of properties of nicotine are probably in part associated with how nicotine works in the brain via acetylcholine. But more and more, we're starting to think that it might also be due to these properties of interactions with epigenetic mechanisms in the brain. So the nicotine, by enhancing the memory, it's also affecting the DNA because that's how memory works. And so the, the whole pattern of addiction of nicotine is all to do with the way it interferes with DNA. Well, it's not interfering with the DNA specifically. It's not changing your DNA necessarily, but it's changing how accessible your DNA is. So in this situation, nicotine is what's called an HDAC inhibitor. So it basically is facilitating that open chromatin state. It's enhancing the ability of genes to be transcribed and made into proteins that are necessary for long-term memory. So one way that we can think about that is that if there's normally a threshold that's required to be passed before a short-term memory becomes a long-term memory. And nicotine, via opening that chromatin, can actually lower that threshold. So a memory that might not necessarily be a really long-term one becomes a long-term memory in the presence of nicotine. And the brain has receptors for something like nicotine. Yeah, so the brain has what's called nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, that nicotine binds to, and obviously they weren't made specifically for the purposes of binding nicotine. Acetylcholine is really important for attentional processes in the brain, and so that's where nicotine, by binding to these receptors, can actually have utility in facilitating attentional processes. So people that smoke, one of the reasons they often cite for not quitting is because they find that it helps them concentrate. And so when they quit, they have problems with that ability to concentrate. So what we're considering is that nicotine has these effects at the nicotine receptor and that there is a, a whole bunch of things that happen with respect to the receptor and the activation of these cholinergic systems, but that there might be this other layer that's occurring at a, a cellular level or a molecular level that is also helping to facilitate the memories being encoded more rapidly. So that it seems to be the, the way that we've thought about it for a long time is probably correct, but that there might just be a whole other layer to it. And you've spoken briefly about some of the perhaps beneficial effects of using nicotine for the memory or the understanding of the way nicotine works. What about for helping people quit? So um, one of the studies that we've done recently was looking at um, reversing these effects of nicotine. So if we consider that um, across the use of nicotine, you're having um, these effects on the molecular basis of memory in your brain, how can they be reversed? And so we find that um, that there are drugs that are available for other purposes, often in the, um, in the field of oncology. A lot of what we know about epigenetics comes from cancer research because um, it's 
potentially involved in a lot of cancers and addressing that can be a new way of looking at treating a variety of cancers. So there's actually quite a lot of information and quite a lot of drugs available for us to use in behavioural epigenetics that have been developed in oncology and are very specific and very useful to us. And so what we can find is that potentially what's happening with nicotine is that it's having these abilities of enhancing memory, but across time and with chronic nicotine use, it might be having the opposite effect. And so then when you go into withdrawal, you've essentially got kind of a tolerance effect to this memory formation. So we might be able to reverse those effects by introducing other types of HDAC inhibitors that potentially can enhance that extinction memory or the inhibitory memory that you need to develop to overcome cravings and prevent yourself from relapsing to smoking. And what about drugs like alcohol? Do they have epigenetic effects as well? So uh, there there have been some studies with alcohol. I'm less familiar with those than um, the some with psychostimulants like cocaine. So the majority of research that's been done in this field has been done with cocaine. And there's a lot of work that's come out of the States in particular. There's one research called Eric Nessler who's done an enormous amount of work in this area. And so cocaine has the same sorts of properties. But nicotine is a bit unique in its ability to kind of prime or epigenetically prime the system to this memory encoding. So there was one really nice study where they gave nicotine before cocaine and nicotine would enhance the plasticity effects of cocaine. But if they gave cocaine before nicotine, that didn't happen. So there's something unique about nicotine that means that it's facilitating these memories and um, these structural changes in the brain that are not the same ones as what cocaine might be having. So yes, there's overlap, but the mechanisms might be different. And it might be that difference that means that giving up nicotine is so much harder. Do you have an opinion on electronic cigarettes? (laughs) So I think that a lot of our work with animals has shown that that the cues surrounding nicotine intake are really, really important. And so when we start thinking about the ways that we can prevent smoking in humans, it's really important, yes, that you address the pharmacology of the smoking, and you can do that via a bunch of ways. So, for example, nicotine patches, substitute for nicotine, lozenges, gums, sprays, all that sort of stuff. There's two medications available in Australia. One is varenicline and one is bupropion that are available for treating smoking. And they're addressing the pharmacological side of it, but they're not addressing the psychological side of it, which is those the ability of those cues to elicit cravings. So even though you might be blocking the pharmacology, that psychological side is controlled by a different part of the brain. And so I guess the thing with e-cigarettes is that they're kind of addressing both of those things because the cigarette itself is a cue and even a cigarette packet or lighting a cigarette is a really strong cue for smoking. And so in smoking an e-cigarette, you're getting the nicotine delivery, which is addressing the pharmacological side of it, but you're also recreating the psychology and the behavioural side of it, which is allowing the user to have something in their hands like a cigarette. And so I think in that way, you're really addressing both aspects of it to some extent and certainly e-cigarettes are going to provide health benefits over smoking so if they're going to reduce your smoking and reduce the intake of toxins then it presumably is a better option than smoking. And I've heard people say that a lot of the anti-smoking ads particularly where they show people lighting up can actually produce cravings for smoking. Yeah, so that seems to be the case. And I know for myself when I do talks that I frequently find that I do a talk and that the people in the audience who use lozenges or gum will be chowing down on that during my talk. And some people have said they don't like my talks because it makes them crave cigarettes. So certainly that is the case that those visual cues are sufficient to elicit cravings and in that way might be counterproductive. I think that the problem with smoking a little bit is that people don't realise that the consequences of smoking are quite far removed from the actual act of smoking. So you can smoke when you're quite young and it's not going to be until you're much older that you'll suffer the consequences and the chances of you having consequences of smoking are very, very high. So 60% of smokers are likely to die of a smoking-related illness. 30% of cancers are associated with smoking, and that's a wide range of cancers, not just lung and throat cancer. So it's a major and significant ongoing risk. It's a risk factor for disorders such as Alzheimer's disease. So it's really something that needs to be addressed, and figuring out how to address it 
is not clear, although a lot of the public health initiatives have been successful in reducing the um, smoking amongst adolescents. And the majority, the vast, vast majority of people start smoking as adolescents. So in cutting that down, then that's obviously going to be beneficial moving forward. Well, Kelly Clemens, thank you very much. You're welcome. That was Kelly Clemens at the University of New South Wales talking about how nicotine interacts with the brain. You're listening to Ian Wolfe on Diffusion Science Radio. Send emails to science at diffusionradio.com. We're brought to you across Australia on the Community Radio Network and podcast over the internet on www.diffusionradio.com. Eastern Australia has been in the grip of record heat waves. Sarah Perkins Kirkpatrick from the University of New South Wales is a climate scientist at the Climate Change Research Centre. She gave a talk at Ultimo Library in Sydney for Inspiring Australia about heat waves, how to measure them, how they've changed, why they've changed, and how they'll change in the future. Back in 2015, I spoke to her after the talk and began by asking her what are the different aspects of heat waves that she measures. So heat waves is my area of study that I've been doing for the last four or so years and I've been researching how to measure them, which is actually a little bit more complex than it sounds, uh, how they've changed and why they've changed and how they're going to look like they will change in the future as well. So what are the different aspects of heat waves that you measure? So you can think of heat waves as anything that includes their duration, their frequency, their intensity, and you can also look at their average intensity as well as their, the peak intensity or the hottest part of the heat wave. You can look at their spatial extent. So what area do they cover? Are you interested, for example, in a heat wave that's just over Sydney or one that covers the whole of New South Wales? You can actually include what time of the year they occur. So we're actually seeing trends now that heat waves are starting to occur earlier in the season. And also that the, the heat wave season is extending at the other end as well. And is a heat wave just oh, a few hot days or what's the definition? So the global definition is just a bunch of words that say a prolonged period of excessive heat. And that's rather ambiguous and it is quite difficult because sometimes it's, it's actually mainly dependent on the impacts. So depending on what impact you're researching, you'll generally use a different definition. But the thing that that definition kind, kind of tries to overarch across is this prolonged period of heat. So generally it doesn't, it can't really be, a heat wave can't be a single day by itself or a single couple of days. It's usually at least three days or more in a row. So heat wave, it doesn't have to go just for three days. It can go for five, 10, 15 days. The Russian heat wave in 2010 went for over a month, but it has to, they have to be in a row. The consecutive days is a really important thing. And there's changes in the heat waves from year to year. And what are the things that influence that? So when we look at heat waves just from a year to year or even um, week to week, there's three main natural drivers, as I call them. So you have synoptic systems. So these are if you look at the weather forecast or if you love going on the Bureau of Meteorology's website and looking at all their, their little maps, that's the synoptic map. And that's the, the, what the weather patterns are doing control heat waves. Uh, how dry the soil is also controls heat waves. So drier soil generally means hotter weather. And that's usually when we, we have hotter weather during droughts. And also what happens in terms of variability at seasonal scales. So, for example, if you've heard of the El Nino phenomena, uh, that usually, usually means from large parts of the country hot, dry weather due to other things that are going in the Pacific Ocean. So we, t we think about heat waves on scales, or they're driven by things on scales that occur on seasonal scales, weekly scales, and you know, the, 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 the drying of the soil can last from anywhere from days, weeks or months. So it's a, there's a time interaction there as well. So the dry soil means the hot air doesn't get as much cooling when it finally gets to us in summer? Yeah, pretty much. So if, if a surface is wet, a lot of the energy goes into evaporating that moisture. Sometimes it might feel quite humid after you've had a downpour of rain and that's because the energy after the, the clouds have gone, the sun's come out again, has gone to evaporating that moisture into the air. So therefore it feels humid. If there's no water left to evaporate, then all the energy that used to go into evaporating water goes into heating the surface. So the less moisture it is, the less moisture that's in the soil or even in the plants that might be on that top of that soil, the drier it is and therefore the hotter it is. Are there overall trends in the change of heat waves? Unfortunately, yes. If we look at heat waves from about 1950 onwards, actually quite possibly earlier than that, but we just don't have the observations to do that. But from at least 1950, we've seen increases in the intensity, frequency and duration of heat waves. Tonight I just talked about that over Australia, but we're also seeing those trends globally as well. And unfortunately, the most scary thing is the number of heat wave days that are increasing. That's quite frightful. 
Also, if we look at, you know, say a shorter time period from, say, 1970 onwards, the trends are greater still. So not only are they increasing, but the rate at which heat waves are changing is also increasing as well. I've got a little unusual question that I've been saving up for a chance to talk to a climate scientist. <laughs> I saw an invention where they're condensing water out of the air instead of desalination. If they did that on a larger scale, would that start changing the weather and the climate? That's a really interesting question. Now, to f I've never heard of this invention. Basically, the hotter air is, the more moisture it can hold. So, and that's, it's to do with what we call a dew point temperature. So you might have a you know, particular day and it feels really humid. That's because the dew point is really high. Because um, that, that air, that temperature of the air can, can hold more moisture and it's got more moisture in it as well. Now, when you compress the air, it pushes all that out and it changes, you know, to do with gaseous states and all that sort of stuff. I won't give you a chemistry lesson, but I, c I can understand how that works. Now, a lot of people don't realise that water vapour is so that the gaseous form of water in the atmosphere is actually a greenhouse gas. But the thing about water vapour is that water on Earth cannot be created or destroyed. We have a finite amount of it and it just moves around in a cycle. And also it's fast moving. So if you think about a night where there's clouds above you, it, it feels warmer. The temperature doesn't drop down as much because those clouds are acting like a blanket. But those clouds move on a daily time scale, even sub-daily. So they don't act like greenhouse gases that humans emit. That it's a much shorter time scale. So if you compress air, yes, it will make it rain. I don't know if therefore that will change the overall water cycle and what's going on in the atmosphere because you can't create or destroy water. It's a, as I said, it's always just circulating. So that's an interesting question. It might be able to make things rain. I'd, I'd want, really wonder though if they can really do it on that, that scale effectively. So my understanding is they're trying to condense it to get water for irrigation. So they're not oh. trying to make it rain. They're trying to just get it on the ground, like, you know, in large amounts in storage. Mm. Like if you had a condensing coil to, to freeze things, only in this case it's all mechanical. Yeah. So you're trying to take the water out of the air and put it into, say, storage or into the soil. Are you therefore dehumidifying the air a lot and will that cause it? A, if you do it on an industrial scale, is it a problem? To me, like, it makes sense. Like, it totally makes physical and chemical sense. I, I guess I've never worked on a farm. That's probably why I haven't heard of it before. You'd have to do it on great, huge scales for it to have an effect. So it's not going to so solve. So actually what, what can happen with climate change, what is happening is because the air is getting warmer, it can hold, hold more moisture. So it might rain less, although when it does rain, it will be, you know, huge downpour because it got more moisture that was actually stored in, but it, it needs more energy for it to actually fall out of the sky. This may work, maybe it might be in a way that, if it's not raining as much over some regions, but we can measure that there's more moisture in the air, say over a farm, you might be able to compress and get that, that moisture out. So you actually you are actually drying the air out, and as, as you said, you're de dehumidifying the air. But I don't know how many dehumidifiers we'd probably have to run to, to, to kind of get more moisture out of the air everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. So thank you for that. I know that was a bit of a yeah, out, no, out there question. question. Well, look, I, I guess, like, you know, those sorts of things I've kind of got to think and criticise in my own brain before I can go, oh, yeah, that's amazing. That's definitely a solution. But it makes physical sense. And I guess it is. It's just a dehumidifier on a bigger scale. But mm. for it to make a huge impact, it'd have to be on a... I, you know, I kind of think of the Simpsons episode where they block the sun out with this great <laughs> disc, which is just, you know implausible and impossible kind of have me on that scale kind of thing for it to make a difference so it's probably pretty harmless for people to use it i was you know we have a dehumidifier in our in our house to, to you know get rid of some of the moisture in the air and i think using on those sorts of scales it's not going to make any difference whatsoever terrific so i, I did actually as mentioned that you know heat waves are changing and unfortunately there's from the research i've done from the research of my colleagues and many other people overseas that the um the main reason behind that is unfortunately due to climate change. So it's over the last 100 years, we've seen an increase of almost one degree Celsius globally. Mm. And we only need a small change in the average temperature to have a disproportionately larger change in the frequency of extremes and even their magnitude as well. And that's unfortunately what we're seeing. Bad news is currently the future is looking like it's going to get worse. Good news is we still have time to change it. So it might be a while before we see those changes if we start switching to greener energy solutions more and more as time goes on, but it will happen eventually. Well, Sarah, thank you very much. That's all right. Thanks very much, Ian. That was Sarah Perkins Kirkpatrick, a research fellow at the University of New South Wales who studies heat waves at the Climate Change Research Centre. And that's all from us this week on Diffusion. Would you like to hear your own voice on radio? Go to the website and click the tab on the right to send a voicemail to be played on air. 
we need more people contributing stories to Diffusion. Send your contributions, opinions, helpful suggestions and donations to science at diffusionradio.com. That's science at diffusionradio.com. Please do send me an email so I know you're listening and would like to hear more episodes. Please like the Diffusion Science Radio page on Facebook and rate us on iTunes. Tell your friends. Follow me on Twitter at Ian Wolf. Support the show at patreon.com slash diffusionradio. Checking production was Charles Willock. I produce Diffusion, which is broadcast around Australia to 27 stations on the community radio network, including 2RBM in the Blue Mountains of New South Wales, 8CCC in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, 2NVR in Nambaka Valley, and 3MBR in the Mallee Border Districts of Victoria and South Australia. Diffusion is syndicated globally on the National Science Foundation's Science360 internet radio station, and also on astronomy.fm. Subscribe to the podcast on the Diffusion website www.diffusionradio.com that's www.diffusionradio.com and check the website for links, photos and videos about this week's show. A video was recorded of last week's interview with Paul Mason and it will be online as soon as it's been edited. If you enjoyed this show, then you can explore more than 900 previous episodes archived on diffusionradio.com where the shows are labelled by keywords so you can focus in on the stories you want to hear. Subscribe to the Diffusion YouTube channel at youtube.com slash c slash Diffusion Radio. I'm Ian Wolfe. Join us inside your audio device of choice for more science wondering next week on Diffusion Science Radio. Science is fun. It helps you to learn, to know and to appreciate. When you study science, you may go on field trips. You discover the marvelous interrelationships between all living things. You learn to read the history of the earth as it is written in rocks and fossils. You find out what makes things tick. Everything from a molecule to a living organism. In the study of science is found the most useful and satisfying knowledge of man. Knowledge of his physical world, its past, its present, and its future. And in your moments of relaxation, now and in the years to come, you will find the study of science leading you into fascinating pursuits. Photography. Collecting. Why study science? Study science because you will find in the study of science a richer, more rewarding life.